Hello everyone, my name is Marijn van Vliet and I will tell you about the role of computer models in the study of language in the brain. As Rita Salmelin has told you during our overview, whenever we show a stimulus to a volunteer in a scanner that contains language in some form, we can observe a series of bursts of activity in the brain. The question I would like to focus on now is what the brain is actually doing during these bursts of activity. What computational processes are being performed as the stimulus hits our senses, gets translated into electrical impulses and travels through the brain? And to be honest, we still know quite little about this. But what I can tell you is that it is a complicated process that involves millions and millions of neurons throughout the entire brain working together. So we're probably going to need a bit more than just pen and paper to figure this out. What we need are computational models that try to mimic the processes in the brain. In order to be useful in neuroscience, a model has three basic requirements. The first requirement is that the model needs to be able to operate on the same stimulus as a volunteer in the scanner. The second requirement is that they can perform the same task as the volunteer, obtaining the same behavioral result. And the third requirement is that they do this task in such a way that the activity within the model mimics at least part of the brain activity that we observe. Such models provide a useful laboratory for new ideas in neuroscience. A new idea, a new theory, can be implemented in the model and then the model can be used to generate predictions of brain activity from the theory. Now these predictions can then be compared to actual brain data recorded from volunteers. The better the theory, the better the model, the better the prediction. So how closely does a model need to simulate the brain? Neuroscience is being performed at a vast array of different scales, ranging all the way from the basic proteins that make up the DNA of a cell, to the cells themselves, neurons themselves, synaptic activity between neurons, all the way to circuits of neurons, brain regions that are communicating to each other, to an entire brain, to an entire organism. When we're studying language, we are usually operating around this level. We are dealing with large networks of neurons that are all working together in order to produce some macro level computation like detecting a letter or retrieving the meaning of a word. Now at this point, I would like to start showing you some examples of computational models that we are currently using in neuroscience. But in order to appreciate what these models are trying to accomplish, we must first make the distinction between models of representation and models of processing. Models of representation aim to organize data in such a way as it might be organized in the brain. They are only concerned with simulating the final organization, not how this organization comes about. In contrast, models of processing aim to model how the brain transforms data from one representation into another. Let's take a look at some models of representation. One of the deep questions of language in the brain is that of the representation of abstract semantics. A word acts as a trigger for a rich semantic representation of a concept that carries a deeper meaning than just that word. How are these concepts represented in the brain? We don't know, but if we want to find out, we have to start somewhere. Start with a model that may be too simplistic, but that we can actually build, so we can learn from it and then try to improve it. A core theme of many, if not all models of semantics, is that the meaning of a concept is tied to the relationship that concept has to other concepts. What is a dog? A dog is an animal. 
with fur that barks and wags its tail. This inspires us to model semantics as a network of related concepts. The model you are looking at now has been constructed with the help of tens of thousands of volunteers who are participating in a small world of words project that is led by Simon de Dene. The volunteers have been presented with a Q word and were asked to write down the first three words that came to mind. And now we can use this data to draw connections between words based on their responses. In such a model, whenever a concept is activated, this activation spreads and co-activates the related concepts. And then it spreads even further and even more concepts are activated. So together they form a rich semantic representation. This network view of semantics has been useful for modeling a phenomenon in the brain known as semantic priming. You have already seen semantic priming at work during Rita Salmanin's overview. When a word is not expected based on the preceding context, there is a larger burst of activity in the temporal cortex. But semantic priming doesn't require complete sentences. It also works when showing a word pair, just two words that are either related or unrelated. You are looking here at some data recorded through EEG instead of MEG. This is why the N400 looks a bit different, but the priming effect is still there. So, reading even a single word will influence how your brain will process words in the future. If we want to model this effect using our network, we can activate the first word in the model and simulate the amount of co-activation of the second word. The amount of co-activation that we simulated is a good indicator for the strength of the priming effect we observe in the brain response. In the small world of words model, connections can be drawn from any word to any other word. We could, however, try to organize this a little bit more. Here is a network model proposed by David Rummelhart and Peter Todd in 1993. We have nouns on the left, and each noun maps to a combination of attributes here shown on the right. Which types of attributes are activated is modulated by these relationship types shown here at the bottom. For example, if we activate the noun canary and the relationship type can, we activate the attributes canaries can grow, canaries can move, canaries can fly, canaries can sing. To achieve this, there are additional nodes in this network that do not represent words or concepts by themselves, but merely function as connection hubs for spreading activation. Such nodes are called hidden nodes, and we will see more of them in other models. A group of nodes is called a layer, and we will also see more of those in other models. Now, this model is more powerful than our initial network model in several ways. First, we can model different kinds of relationships between words. That's always useful. But second, this layer on the right, the attributes layer, holds a pretty efficient representation of the meaning of a concept. In this layer, each concept is represented as a unique combination of attributes. For example, a fir is a tree, it is tall, it's green, it has bark and roots and so on. And grass is also green and also has roots, but it is a plant rather than a tree and it's not tall and so on. Even with a limited set of attributes, we can represent many different concepts. Can you think of a way to
to simulate the semantic priming effect using this model. Here is one way. We could have attributes stay active for a while when a new word is presented that shares many of the same attributes as the preceding words. Those attributes will have been pre-activated, hence the word will be processed faster. Representing concepts as a collection of attributes is pretty efficient, but there's even a more efficient way. And that is within this hidden layer over here. All activity passes through this layer on its way to the attribute layer. So all the information needed to identify a concept must already be present at this stage. And there are far fewer nodes in this hidden layer than in the attribute layer. The nodes in this layer form what we call a semantic embedding space. It is currently one of the most popular ways to represent the meaning of concepts in a computational model. To get an intuition for what's going on at this layer, it's best to leave this model behind for now and talk about another model called word to vec The word to vec model was developed by a research team at Google led by Thomas Migalov and published in 2003. And the way it works is as follows. We read in a large amount of text, books, news articles, subtitles from television programs, anything we can get our hands on. We take all the unique words we've encountered in the text, that's usually a couple of million, and assign them a random position in a space that we call the semantic embedding space. Here I am drawing a three-dimensional embedding space, so it's easy to visualize, but usually you take a space with many dimensions. Now we go over the text again, and every time two words occur together in the same sentence, we move those words a little closer together in the embedding space. And every once in a while we stop and move words that have never occurred together a little further apart. We keep doing this until we have read all of the text we had collected. And for good measure, we start from the beginning of the text again and again until the positions of the words in the embedding space no longer change much. And at that point we say that the model has converged. The resulting positions of the words in the embedding space have very interesting properties. First of all, we have achieved a very efficient representation as we can identify millions of unique words just by their location in the embedding space. Again, in this visualization, I only use three dimensions, meaning a word is represented by only three numbers. But in a real model, you usually use hundreds of dimensions, so words are represented by hundreds of numbers. A second interesting property of this model is that words that occur often together in the same sentence are also close together in the embedding space. And also, words that maybe not co-occur together, but they both occur in similar types of context, they are also drawn together in the embedding space. The location of a word in the semantic embedding space determines its meaning. And that location is determined by looking which words co-occur with that word. Meaning, again, in this model, the meaning of a word is defined by the relationship between that word and other words. A third interesting property of this semantic embedding space is that directions through this space also have meaning. And that is something you will experiment with yourself in an exercise that I will introduce at the end of this lecture. Now that you are familiar with the concept of a semantic embedding space, 
I can explain to you what's going on in this hidden layer of the model we looked at earlier. Each node in this layer represents a single dimension of a semantic embedding space. And together, the activity across these nodes represents a location in semantic embedding space. There. Let's now look at how semantic embedding spaces, like the one we created with the word to vec algorithm, are used to study the representation of semantics in the brain. I'd like to illustrate this with some fMRI data collected by Kivisari et al. and published in 2019. In this study, the participants were asked to solve little riddles as a way to get them to concentrate on different concepts. For example, to get them to focus on the concept of a banana, they would be told to think about something that was yellow, sweet, and eaten by monkeys. So here is the brain activity as the participant was focusing on a banana, as recorded through fMRI. And here is the brain activity for a helicopter and a cow. On the left, you see a semantic embedding space, projected down to two dimensions for easy visualization. You can see the original 300-dimensional coordinate of the word as a bar graph below the brain. Now, here's the interesting thing. The closer words are in the embedding space, the more similar the corresponding brain activity patterns. In a way, the brain activity we record acts as an embedding space of its own. If you treat every voxel as a dimension in embedding space, you get an embedding space with a crazy high dimensionality, and the pattern of activity across the voxels represents a location in this embedding space. So now we have two embedding spaces. On the one hand, we have the embedding space created by the word to vec model using a huge amount of text. And on the other hand, we have an embedding space defined by the brain activity as recorded through fMRI. The former acts as a computational model of the latter. By creating a linear mapping between the word to vec embedding space and the brain activity embedding space, we can predict the brain activity pattern of a word based on its location in word to vec space. In 2016, Huth et al. published a study that explored the possibilities of such a mapping in detail. They collected brain activity patterns in response to many different words by having volunteers listen to stories in an fMRI scanner. Using machine learning, they created a mapping between word to vec space and the embedding space defined by the brain activity pattern. This model could predict the brain activity of a word given its position in the word to vec space. Of course, it predicts brain activity better at certain locations than other. Notably, activity in the areas associated with semantic processing was predicted best. They proceeded to examine for each voxel in the brain the words that activated that voxel the strongest. And they found that each voxel has a preference for words from within a certain region of the word to vec embedding space. Now we already saw that words that are close together in an embedding space share a similar meaning. So what the authors of the study did was assign category labels to different regions of the embedding space. You can see those at the bottom left and they gave each category a different color. Now, a preference for words from a certain region becomes a preference for a category. Voxels can thus be assigned a preference for a certain category, yielding this pretty semantic atlas 
of which parts of the brain have a preference for which categories. For example, this voxel is most active for words related to visual features. And this one for words concerning relationships. And this one to numbers. Admittedly, this is stretching the mapping between a computational model and the brain activity a bit far, and I'm not sure how accurate this result truly is. But it is a good demonstration of how far you can take computational models of representation. So now, let's take a look at some models of processing. These types of models usually come in the form of an artificial neural network, where each layer in the model is a representation of the stimulus. And the computation to transition from one representation to the next is symbolized by connections between the layers. You are currently looking at a multi-layer perceptron network that is reading handwritten numbers. The first layer in this network contains the pixel values of the input image. This pixel representation is transformed as it transitions through the layers, straightening out the pixel level differences so that at the end of the model, all different versions of a number end up activating the same unit. We started out with a low level representation where each difference in the pixels of the input image caused the representation to change. But we gradually move to a high-level representation that only cares about patterns of pixels. Now, while the nodes of this network, upon first glance, may look like they are simulating biological neurons, they are actually not, and that is okay. Remember that at this level, Remember that when modeling language in the brain, we are concerned with modeling the macro-level computations as performed by large groups of neurons instead of individual neurons. You can think of each node in this network as roughly representing the sum activity of thousands of biological neurons. More precisely, the model is attempting to perform the same overall computation as the brain irregardless of how this computation is performed by the biological neurons. In this model, each node in a layer is connected to every other node in the next layer. We can make this a more accurate model of the human visual system by restricting these connections. In the visual cortex, many neurons are found to have a receptive field, meaning they are only sensitive to certain areas of your visual field. When we apply the same rule to the model, we obtain what is known as a convolutional neural network. The nodes in the second and third layers are only connected to the pixels within a small patch of the input image. They tend to operate as image filters that, for example, detect edges or curves. The final layers remain fully connected, as before, to assemble the edges and curves that were extracted from the entire image. This little network just reads numbers. But if we make the network a little larger and add a few more layers, this network is capable of detecting thousands of different types of objects, about as well as humans do. It is said that convolutional neural networks, such as this one, are among the best performing models when it comes to simulating the most basic visual processing in the human brain. So let's talk about how we can compare a model such as this to actual brain data. Here is a larger model that can recognize written words, taken from one of my own studies. This model aims to provide a computational account of some of the processing steps during single word reading. Rita Salmelin showed these in her overview as well. We have processing of basic visual features, detection of letter strings, and detection of a whole word. 
The model doesn't go into the sound form or abstract semantic meaning. And these stages are associated with three components of the brain activity. We will be comparing the model to the MEG activity recorded by Vartijainen et al. in 2011. In the MEG experiment, they showed various types of visual stimuli to the volunteers, designed to highlight the three processing stages and their corresponding components. Here are the locations of these components for each volunteer, and below is the average activity of each component in response to the different stimulus types. You can see that each component responds differently to each stimulus type. We actually want to reduce this time course down to a single number, so we'll take the average in a suitable time window. In this manner, we can compute for each stimulus in the experiment the mean activation of the three brain activity components. Now for the model. We fed the same stimuli as we used in the MEG experiment through the model and recorded the mean ReLU activation in each layer. Here is the comparison between the brain and the model. Let's go over the three components one by one. The first component, during which the brain is thought to perform basic visual processing, reacts sharply to the amount of visual noise in the image. And we see the same behavior in the first convolution layers of the model. The second component, during which the brain is thought to perform detection of letter shapes, is activated less for noisy stimuli. It's also activated less when the stimulus did not contain valid letters but symbols that are like letters, but they're not actually part of the alphabet. And we see this behavior arising in the later layers of the model. At the final two convolution layers, we also see this decrease in activity in response to symbols that are not letters. However, the response pattern doesn't quite match that of the second component, as these layers still respond to visual noise and the brain component did not. For the fully connected layers, the response pattern does match quite nicely with the second component of the brain activity. Finally, we have the third component, during which the brain is thought to detect the whole world. Here, we see a distinction between the stimuli that are actually words, or pseudo-words, and stimuli that are obviously not words, such as consonant strings. And this behavior we see in the final layer of the model, which matches this response pattern quite well. So here we have a model that's able to operate on the same stimuli as the volunteers in the scanner, and is able to perform the same task, and while doing so, produces activity that mimics some components of the brain activity. Martin Schrimpf et al started a computation called BrainScore, in which researchers can compare their computational model against brain activity recorded during a variety of tasks. Models are scored according to their ability to accurately model activity recorded from different parts of the brain. This computation is very much focused on models of vision, which is a domain in which I think our models have advanced the most. But of course, there's much more to language than just reading single words. And we've barely scratched the surface of computational models that are ever larger, more accurate, and ever more ambitious.